morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome back to CIBC Presents Entrepreneurship 101. Uh, we've got a, a great winter season ahead of us with lectures. Uh, glad to see you here. Uh, just a couple of details. I know some of you are interested in details on the Upstart competition. Uh, at the beginning of next week's lecture, I will be giving you some details and we'll be posting uh, information about that. Okay. Um, I want to thank our special sponsors uh, for this evening's lecture. Uh, that's the law firm of Ogilvy Renault. Uh, they have a number of people present here in the audience uh, and uh, at the end of the lecture if any of you are interested in free legal advice um, I'll, I'll gladly hook you up i see the ogilvy renault folks ducking um, they have been a uh, an important part of mars really since our doors opened you will find their offices um, that's the Beam office right there on the first floor, the one with the big uh, uh, British uh, telephone booth in there. You can't miss them. Um, but they've been a great friend to this course over the years. They've sponsored things. Uh, they regularly put on a, uh, a sessions on how to draft a patent application. Uh, more on which uh, I'll be talking uh, later on in the season. So they're a strong member of the Mars community and we're delighted to have them as a sponsor for what I think is going to be a very interesting lecture. Uh, tonight's lecture is, is John Abley. Um, it's part of our Lived It series. And I'm going to uh, ask the, uh, the CEO of Mars, Ilse Cernik, to, to make the introduction. Thank you very much, Tony. Uh, good evening, everybody, and Happy New Year. Um, we are in for a treat uh, this evening. Uh, John Abley, as you know, is a co-founder and a director of Boston Scientific, um, the world's uh, largest medical devices company focused on uh, that very key innovation of less invasive uh, medical technologies. Um, he, as you would expect, holds many patents. He's widely published on uh, not just the technology aspects of many kinds of medical devices, but also on the sort of economic and social and political aspects of, of uh, the emerging trends in healthcare. Um, he's got a great passion for science literacy in kids, and uh, many of you are probably familiar with his uh, robotics programs for um, students, which have been uh, incredibly popular in, in getting them engaged in, in putting science to work. Um, but in a, in a sort of a quirky trajectory, in the recent years, um, social networking has become his real passion. Uh, he owns um, the Kingbridge uh, Collaboration Center just north of Toronto. And there he really studies how you can harness uh, collaboration to create a new kind of uh, uh, capability and, and capacity. Uh, now you would say, how do you get from medical devices to uh, social networking? Well, in the 1970s, John pioneered a, what was at the time a very controversial course um, that involved a live demonstration um, of, of a med applied medical procedure. And uh, not only was the format new, um, he also engaged um, commercial, professional, and academic participants um, in the demonstration, everyone with an equal opportunity to comment on what they were observing. Uh, now at first, of course, those interactions were quite jarring because they were new for everybody. Uh, but then over time, as people got more comfortable with the format, they realized that the, the learning experience was actually greatly enriched by having these different perspectives around the table. And so John became very intrigued by this process of how you can um, create a, an environment in which collaboration um, can, uh, can actually um, really become effective. And, uh, and that's been his, uh, his real passion. Now the process of entrepreneurship, obviously taking ideas uh, and putting them uh, into the market, um, feels at times a very lonely process, but um, at its core it's a very complex collaboration process and that will certainly be stress tested in this economic environment further. So we're absolutely delighted that John is here today to come and share with us not just his unique insights, but uh, wonderful wisdom from uh, Garnet from many, many years of being a real pioneer in this business. John, thank you so much and welcome.
Thank you. Well, uh, again, thank you, Ilsa. And um, I should start off, perhaps, by saying the, the thrust of what I'm going to talk about is a combination of collaboration and uh, how to survive what appears to be a new world order. Um, October uh, was, was a dramatic change in time. And for a lot of people, particularly in small startups and so forth, the question is, how do you do what we were doing in an environment that is going to be much more difficult to do it? Uh, so the, um, the, the, the title of this sort of uh, missive uh, is The Collaboration Paradox. Uh, and I, with a little bit of a cynical uh, uh, phrase underneath it. Uh, I don't know, have any of you seen the uh, successories, which if you travel in an airline, uh, they sell these posters that have these wonderful uh, uh, statements and usually, you know, how to succeed and do wonderful great things. Well, there's another one uh, that uh, puts up the opposite. Uh, and I've forgotten what, what, it, what it's called, but anyway, this is a quote uh, from that. And it's very important, I think, as you go into the business world to maintain that balance of, of skepticism and humor along with uh, passion and uh, belief. It's really the balance of those that is likely to get you through the, the challenges. But perhaps within that, the issue is to recognize that you don't just go and acquire a talent to build a business or solve a problem. You constantly learn. It's, it's a changing situation, not a static situation. And we have now been given the privilege of having an incredible change uh, that is going to require a lot of our fundamental institutions in society to adapt. Education, banking, law. Uh, how we do that, you're going to have the opportunity to influence. I mean, we all are. Uh, and that's going to be uh, a challenge. One of the things that's really true is if you think that collaboration is difficult, October is going to make collaboration easier. <laughs> the, the necessity is not only the mother of invention, necessity is the mother of collaboration. And if you think about the specific issues or problems you may have, there are going to be some really creative opportunities for relating to folks. And um, if you think about collaborations as meetings. Now, I'm having my conference center mindset or a mindset like what we're going through right now uh, in mind, but a meeting is more than simply a physical get-together like this. It can be virtual. You all have collaborations or whether it's conference calls or, or uh, go-to-meeting type meetings on the computers and so forth. They can be synchronous and they can a and they can be asynchronous. But the real key is to recognize that a collaboration isn't just people working together. A collaboration at its peak is one in which the collective intelligence of all is harnessed and put together. There are actually university positions uh, trying to work on this, both uh, in the business schools, in the psychology departments, uh, and, and even in the law schools, although there are fewer of them in the law schools, but I've always, I think that's a, you know, a wonderful challenge. But how do you bring people together so that you harness the collective intelligence of, of everybody? Now, lots of descriptions of ways in which people together. I think you've had some unconferences here, haven't you, uh, Elsa? Um, and the impediments to collaboration are enormous. Lots of books uh, written on it. This one certainly describes the basic principles. And if you think about uh, 
uh, academia, for example. Academia was built on the principle of people uh, discovering a great deal of information in a very specific field. It's the principle of silos. And yet we all know that great invention comes not from within one of those silos, but when you bump silos uh, together. And if you think of attempts to get people together, uh, you have things like the Tower of Babel, and we all know that that actually didn't work out too well. And by the way, it still isn't working out too well. That could be the United Nations. Uh, we, we are repeating lots of Towers of Babel uh, all over the world. And then you have boards of directors. How many of you uh, serve on a board of, of directors? Can you raise your hand? Now, either, either it's your company or somebody else's company. But you've got a, print, you know, you've got a, a, a duty as, as a member of a board of directors uh, to make sure that the, uh, the company's vision is, is solid, uh, that they are executing on that vision, that they have the right people in place. You don't get involved in the details, but you ought to be able to find things that need correction. A lot of it may be focused on the people side, but think about this. Uh, what is it? Seven of the largest banks in the world proceeded to literally what? Destroy the capitalistic system? Damn near it. Uh, you got to ask, where were the boards of directors in that? Uh, Bernie Madoff, you know, lots of jokes uh, about that name. The word Madoff uh, uh, is, is, is pretty good. A $50 billion Ponzi scheme uh, and people recommending people to go and invest money in this firm. Now, those are people who are providing guidance to, in this case, investors, but in, fa in, in essence, they were performing a board type function, and basically they did this. Uh, they uh, subscribed to group think. If Charlie is doing this, it must be okay. Now this guy, Bernie Madoff, in fact, was a, uh, a well-known guy, great uh, reputation, had been president of NASDAQ, so that meant that he had credentials. But you got to ask, how did this happen? And therefore, what happened with true collaboration where you're harnessing the collective intelligence of everybody? Well, there's a problem. We have lots of means in which we communicate. We have verbal communication. We have the, the signals that we send that may be body motion or it may even be the way in which we verbalize things. This book, uh, written by Sandy Pentland, uh, shown there, uh, he uh, works for the Media Lab at MIT. And what he did was developed a device that tries to measure your nonverbal signals, what he calls the honest signals. Now it makes me think of Ponzi schemes again. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great book. And it really makes you think about how you get people to truly collaborate, how you get people in a board to speak out and not get trapped by groupthink. How do you bring different scientists together and not play one-upmanship games? It's difficult. Uh, governments have difficulties. Uh, businesses have difficulties. Certainly, uh, universities have difficulties. And I'm saying the people who figured out the solution to that problem have incredible opportunities, particularly now. So in the medical world, uh, I, I love the headline uh, on, on this particular story, but people have done studies on surgical teams, which surgical, surgical teams work the best, meaning the ones that had the best result, fewest complications, shortest time, uh, happiest patients, etc. 
And it wasn't the ones that had the great uh, God with a lot of people supporting that great God. It was, in fact, what you would suspect, a, an environment where the second in charge could say, I don't think this is right. By the way, that's not only a problem in the operating room, that's a problem in airplanes. Are you aware of this? Are you aware, for example, that the Swiss Air flight uh, that uh, crashed uh, off Nova Scotia uh, was an example when they listened to the cockpit flight recorder. Uh, the second officer was trying to get the attention of the captain to say that there's something going wrong. There was, a, there was smoke that he was listening, uh, smelling. And the captain uh, dismissed it. And that became such a problem that the International uh, uh, Airline Association, I've forgotten that's not the exact uh, name of it, has required that pilots must take training in making sure that they listen to everybody in the cockpit. That's the concept of collective intelligence. But it's very difficult to do. And Chinese have been in talking about this uh, forever. Uh, and, and the whole concept of making yourself look foolish to the crowd, humbling yourself before the masses, is in fact a mechanism for getting people to avoid groupthink, to be honest, to be open. Uh, wisdom of crowds, the concept of getting a group of people together in such a way that the decisions and the observations they make are better and more intelligent than the most intelligent individual in the group. How do you do that? Well, there are three principles that are essential to make that happen. The first one is it's got to be a diverse group. By diverse group, think culture, think age, uh, think knowledge background, think experience. Now. Think about the fact when people bring scientists together. They have a filter that automatically excludes that very same diversity. And as a result, you get people who come up with decisions that are within the framework of the, the silo mentality that goes on. So getting people from outside the field is really essential. There is, in fact, going on in the United States today uh, a controversy over the appointment of the new chief of the CIA. His name is Leon Panetta. He was never an intelligence expert. And therefore, the intelligence community says, this is bad. What is his experience? He has a lot of experience in international relations and so forth. I'm saying they recognize this wisdom of crowds phenomenon and say, we need somebody who gets people to work together. And uh, in addition to having diversity, here are the other two features that are necessary for achieving a wise crowd. Think of a wise crowd now being a business group or, or whatever you might, you might do. Or maybe even a collection of customers where you're trying to do research. How do you do that to get the best information? Well, secondly, you've got to have a mechanism for getting contributions from everybody not leaving out the quiet person, or whatever it might be. You've got to get contributions, and it's got to be easy to get. And thirdly, you have to have a means of aggregating that data and using it, hopefully pretty quickly, so you can feed it back to the people who are involved. It's not that complicated. It's just that people don't do it. And uh, the people who do do it have much more successful gatherings. And we are now in this world where you can do it. You can do this mass collaboration. Uh, and I think we're only beginning to see how it's going to play itself out. Uh, the United States election uh, with Obama in the new presidency used this a great deal in his campaign, but he is planning to use it in creating a mechanism for getting mass input on lots of issues. Now, 
This is a big experiment and probably won't work, but over time it'll evolve and learning how to manage this in your organization is key. Another factor, ego. A lot of people say drop your ego at the door when they come into meetings like this. But in fact, if you are leading an organization, you don't have ego, you're probably in real trouble. The key is balance and recognizing, think about the people that you respect right now, the people that you respect as leaders. These are people who combine interesting characteristics of humility and confidence. It's, it's a rare thing, but when you do it, you tend to respect people. These are the people who are open to new ideas, but in fact know how to analyze and understand. And uh, how many of you have seen this program? This is in the form of a slideshow, a video. How, how many of you? Have you, any of you seen this? Yeah, twice. <laughs> uh, hey, uh, explore tonight. When you go home, Google Shift Happens. This is a program, it's, it's a presentation, if you will, and it's got a lot of different formats. That was originally written by a high school teacher to explain to the other faculty members that kids learn differently now, and they are motivated by different things, and we have to understand what's going on. And that's what this is all about. It, points out little things like Facebook and MySpace together, two social networks, are larger than the populations of Japan and Mexico combined. So these are, these are real big uh, uh, changing phenomena. And the implications of that are not just that you can talk to anybody, uh, it's that the way in which decisions are made, the way in which uh, information and knowledge can become democratized is going to change the way in which business works, in which uh, decisions are made in government, uh, and in many, many other areas. And this, again, is, is what I think is a passion that can influence uh, all of us. Uh, this is a fascinating article I saw the other day uh, by C.K. Uh, Pralahad, uh, who was a business professor at the University of Michigan. And in it, he describes a number of innovations that are taking place in India that are not just, you know, small differences from what exists today, but they're big differences. For example, there's a hotel chain in India uh, where the charge is $20 a night. And that hotel sits right next to a fancier hotel uh, that uh, non-Indians are invited to stay in that costs $300 a night. Yet that small hotel has flat screen television, has uh, high speed uh, internet, uh, and very nice affair. How can India One, which is the company that runs these hotels, make money on it? But they do. It's profitable. That's a you know, fundamentally different way of innovating, creating a change that's really dramatic. Um, it's sometimes more difficult to introduce dramatic changes into society because you'll get more resistance from the establishment, but in fact those are the ones that are most rewarding. And that, of course, is the thing that I was involved in in the medical world when we introduced the concept of, of uh, less invasive medicine. This was uh, uh, yesterday's New York Times uh, talking about something that people actually had been talking about for many years. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, telemedicine is widely practiced uh, uh, throughout uh, the world, not just North America. But in fact, the idea of doing it on the web and making house calls is a bit of a different concept. And this one is going to be tried out in, in Hawaii. They think they've got the economic model. Think of it as an iTunes approach 
uh, to medicine. And think about how this could transform the delivery of health care. More, better, for less. Wow, that's what real innovation is. And uh, I just saw the other day a variation of this, which was kind of cute. It was a kiosk where the kiosk, in theory, would be put in pharmacies or drugstores. And they would allow the patient to test themselves and have a conversation with a doctor of just a little cube they'd go in and sit down, measure the blood pressure, uh, and a number of things that could be done remotely. They talk with a doctor and they have, in essence, in this case, uh, a house call, but it's a house call in, in a drugstore. Uh, it's much more efficient for the patient. They don't have to go and have the parking problem that you have in every hospital in the world. And uh, they don't have to worry about food because it doesn't take that long. And uh, it has uh, a lot of benefit. But clearly, uh, you have wait list problems in, in Canada, which is a major problem. And you need to come up with, with approaches that basically commoditize the delivery of health care in a much more effective way. Is that the answer? I can't tell you whether it is or not. But these are the types of ideas that are going to be world changing. Uh, these are the tools that are going to help people to do it. And there's probably going to be a, a lot more uh, after that. Let me ask a question. How many of you, raise your hand, have a blog? Good. That's a and and uh, I've I've asked that sometimes with CEO groups, and uh, and they sort of laugh. Uh, very rarely do they have a blog, and I'm saying that's actually there are some large corporate CEOs who have blogs. There are university presidents that have blogs. There are hospital presidents who have blogs. Now think about the significance of that. If you are having a blog, you are making an effort to personalize your communication to your audience. Uh, I'm passionate about uh, corporate communications not coming from a department. I think they should come from a person. And I think department things are you know, hiding behind uh, a barrier. So how you do that, in my mind, is critical. If a leader is writing a blog, and, and uh, Chad Holliday, the CEO of DuPont, is, is one of those people, and they have a very high uh, satisfaction rating among their employees and a very low turnover rate, that's how I submit, there were a lot of other factors as well, of course, but I would submit that is one of uh, the factors that uh, is related to uh, running an organization with a human face. Uh, there are other uh, uh, tools that are of interest too. Predictive intelligence is one of them. Uh, prediction markets, the concept actually is, is quite old, but it's the idea, uh, it, it's another variation of wisdom of crowds. The idea is, in this case, this is in medicine, how do you harness the contributions of many physicians all over the world. They've got, I think, 60,000 people are registered contributors to this physician uh, network. And uh, these people will uh, respond to problems that are submitted uh, by physicians who have a problem. And the ability to get instant information from physicians who are much closer to these problems uh, is, is really interesting. The economic model of this is kind of intriguing, and that is physicians who are uh, writing answers that are liked and appreciated by the users of this uh, network uh, are rewarded with financial incentives. If a lot of people use it, then 
uh, they, they pay money into the system to be part of the network, but in fact now the people who are providing the most useful information get rewarded for providing useful information. So it's a very interesting concept, but something that obviously scared a lot of people in the regulatory world, and a lot of, a lot of lawyers were concerned about this too, but in fact it's, it's guidance, it's advice, it's not uh, uh, necessarily the answer. And there are other uh, variations that different uh, uh, companies use uh, to order, understand their marketplaces uh, in a more honest way. Um, in the case of, of uh, Boston Scientific, uh, Ilsa described briefly uh, one of the, the, the challenges that we faced and how we faced it, and I'll get to that. But uh, in my view, this is the description of the marketplace we live in today. And that, that thing I just mentioned, shift happens, I hope you wrote that down uh, so you can Google it, uh, that describes basically the phenomenon of the accelerating rate of change, particularly technologically, but in fact the technology change is precipitating cultural change. And that's why if you have uh, you know, young kids today, uh, it's sometimes harder to understand them because they Twitter all the time and they do things that uh, you may not be as, as familiar with. But there's a dilemma in the medical world, and I would say that this applies to a lesser extent to some other feelings and that another, other uh, areas. In the area of technology, in medicine, it's also accelerating. We are solving problems more and more rapidly, uh, whether it's the brain, whether it's the heart, the ability to see, the ability to measure, the ability to get instant information, real-time uh, motion, uh, so forth, imaging, uh, the ability to do genetic uh, analysis is constantly growing, uh, but our ability to assess that technology is not. And therefore, there's a big gap and a growing gap between the rate of technology advancement and the ability to assess it. So by the time you've assessed it, it's already obsolete. And that's why we have regulatory agencies. Sorry, couldn't let that go. Um, so that leads to some fundamental uh, problems. Uh, how are you going to assess those uh, technologies and how are you going to assess the procedures that come out of them because that's the way medicine works. Uh, how are you going to train the people to use it and how are you going to know that they're really trained? And of course, how are you going to keep, keep them up to date? And uh, can you in fact keep up with those accelerations? How do you create a balance with new technology and known technology when the new technology, because you don't understand how it's going to behave in every, every area where it's going to be used, there's a certain risk of using it. And yet, where you know it's going to be used, it's much less risky and more effective than the alternative it replaces. So you've got incredible trade-off analysis to, uh, to go through. And of course, how are you going to pay for it? Is it going to come out of your tax dollars or can it come out of different uh, contribution mechanisms? And there's tons of problems when you go to assess things. Uh, a lot of people say you shouldn't get somebody in the assessment process who has a, f a business type connection because they obviously have a conflict of interest. But then again, a scientist who's done work in that area may have a conflict of interest as well. It may be for getting a grant, or it may be a professional promotion. So the measure, the, the observation is, look, everybody has a conflict of interest. There's no such thing as a true honest broker, unless they know nothing about it. And so sometimes that's what government does, is they will bring in somebody who knows nothing about it in order to solve the conflict of interest problem and trade it off for the other problem. So you have bias, you have, uh, by the way, you have rhetorical skills. You ever have arguments with people about a technical issue and they are so smooth and slick in their presentation, even though their knowledge of the technology is awful. 
And the presentation tends to win. That's a, that's a, that's a dilemma. And uh, that's what you learn when you watch political debates, I guess. But uh, it is a challenge. And how do you address politically correct science or politically correct uh, regulation? Uh, these, are, these are the uh, dilemmas that uh, we are faced with. Now, from an educational point of view, the way you used to educate surgeons anyway, uh, this is how it was done in the late 1800s in, in Vienna. Uh, you had the, uh, the, the auditorium here, so to speak, uh, the amphitheater, and the surgeon with the beard, you can pretty well tell that, that he's the guy in charge. And by the way, they were all he then. And uh, the, the people further up couldn't see as well, and they couldn't hear as well. So how do you solve that problem? Well, it turns out with the development of consumer video in the mid-70s, an approach to solve that was developed. The guy sitting uh, on the steps there with a white suit and, and, a, and a mustache was, in fact, the father of angioplasty, that's the procedure where a catheter can be snaked into the coronary artery and open up uh, an occlusion or a narrowing of the artery without surgery. And it, it's a rather fascinating story. And he came up with this concept of doing cases live before this audience. But now with video, uh, he could be larger than life, uh, and the way he did it is he treated his audience as partners, which sounds kind of strange. He actually would poll the audience for their views on what he ought to do next, so they'd take a vote. And he wouldn't necessarily follow their vote, but he would listen to them and let it influence him. And uh, those faces in the audience uh, have turned out to be great leaders from all over the world in the field of cardiology. So what he did is he solved this problem that not many people could see or hear by adding the television to it, really following the sports model. You know, you, if you go to a hockey game, you can see a lot more on TV. I mean, you get the excitement of the, 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 uh, the arena, but you can see more on television, and that's why more and more people, by the way, are taking portable televisions with them to the arena. So uh, the world is rather strange. But uh, the idea is once you get into the imaging world, it means you can have lots of different types of images, not just one. And uh, you would always have the risk of one doctor having a very limited and biased point of view. And that is, you know, here's God talking. This is the... Uh, what was the, uh, that, that movie of the, the law school guy? Uh, uh, I'll think of it. Uh, but basically, the hair professor doctor, the professor has extra power. And unfortunately, if you raise your hand and question uh, that person, you're putting yourself at risk. In this case, uh, uh, they got around that by having a panel of contrarian experts who were chosen for the fact that they differed from this great boss, but they were important in themselves. So you in the audience now were listening to a variety of ideas. And you would also have put up on the screen or picture in picture, however you do it, uh, simultaneous studies that would be both pro and con on what you were watching real time. And then, of course, you had the problem of, just like we do here, some people in the audience are very familiar with the technology, and some aren't. How do you make it even for everybody? And what they would do is they would actually have another screen that would explain the technology being used so people could be uh, brought up to date uh, very quickly and easily. And then, how do you know whether, in fact, you're getting your point across? whether you're being a successful teacher or not. Well, you have audience response uh, clickers. Now think about that. The advantage of having a means of having the people in the audience answer these questions is that 
it's anonymous. You're not going to be embarrassed. And you don't find out what the individual replies are. You find out what the collective replies are. So it really has become a very, very powerful technique for making the educational process as well as assessment process far more efficient than it ever was. And in terms of the field where this was applied, it basically collapsed the development time and time to introduction to market by almost half. Really, it was a phenomenal thing. Now, can you apply that in other areas or is this only medicine? Don't know, think about that. Anyway, it becomes kind of a, a, a strange show and in many ways it's a bit controversial because there are uh, corporate uh, types, there are business people contributing as well. And uh, there are not only specialists, but there are people in other specialties. And there are government people and regulators and lawyers who also contribute. But it's that diversity that makes it really powerful and really worthwhile. And because you have this variety of views, you trust the information you're getting a lot more. At one of those meetings, I asked the question, well, first question I asked was, how many of you think the patient is being treated ethically? Because after all, everybody was looking at the patient, and they were sort of voting on what to do next, so you wonder about that. But in fact, about Two-thirds of the people, it, it was a, uh, a scale of one to five question, and two-thirds of the people were over the midpoint, so they, they felt it was, it was okay. But one-third felt it was not okay, it wasn't ethical. So I asked the next question. In your own hospital, how often do you feel patients are treated ethically and fairly? And the answer was exactly the same. <laughs> so. Um, you know, that includes things like being forced to wait. Uh, and the, the real magic to this phenomenon, and think about this as you think about organizing things, and think about appointing a director of a CIA, is the people who organize these meetings are not part of the establishment. They're individual physicians. There will be establishment physicians there. There will be experts who are famous there. But they don't control the outcome. I would argue that is a universal truth. And that's why I like the concept of a Leon Panetta type actually running the CIA. I don't think you have to be an expert on intelligence methods. I think you have to be somebody who understands the implication of the information you're going to get. Uh, and I would argue that's true in any business that you are in. And if you're talking to customers, it's important to get that range of customers and by the way see how they interact with each other understand the dynamic and the psychology of the group dynamic in new fields if you're working on a new product uh, or well a, a product that dramatically changes the way things are done don't go after the biggest market first because there will be a lot of people whose ox is going to be gored if you are successful. The establishment gets hurt if you challenge the establishment. So what you want to find is people who have applications that aren't quite as big that in fact you can learn a lot more from, they will be much more forgiving with you, they're happy to have the access to your neat technology. So th this is a problem sometimes because the venture capitalists sometimes will want to go after the biggest market in order to get the most uh, financial interest, but that conflicts with 
the ability to uh, create the market most successfully. That is what happened with our market with Boston Scientific. Uh, there are tons of books that are almost experiments in how massive groups interact. This book is written by 4,000 authors. And when you read it, actually it's, yeah, it's got a way to go, but it's, it's something that I think you're gonna see more of and people are going to continually fine tune the development of that process. And you think about how this might be applicable to you uh, having access to a large number of people very quickly and getting a, a common statement together, I think this is what you're going to see in governments. They've got a ways to go, but uh, it'll be interesting to see. IBM is doing an immense amount of work uh, in this area. Uh, they've been having an annual idea jam each year. Uh, I suppose that's redundant for annual. And uh, they have, it's 100,000 people who participate. And they put up different types of problems uh, and get responses from people on those problems. And the ideas are posted so the answers which come up uh, sort of progressively act as stimulants for other people to come up with other answers. And so it's an interesting way of, again, trying to harness collective intelligence. And this whole concept of reaching out to more people and getting ideas that are not just totally random control. There's, a, there's an accountability that influences the contributors to the process. Uh, one of the ones that I got involved with uh, is a project at, at, it's located at Stanford, but in fact is a biomedical engineering collaboration that involves 100 uh, schools with biomedical engineering programs in it, and every school is responsible for contributing information and data on different elements of bioengineering. In essence, they're creating a Wikipedia for bioengineering. The Wikipedia is such a phenomenon because the quality is pretty good. And it is edited by these groups of people you're not supposed to know, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a fairly large number. And if you think about the problem that any large organization a business, a government, a not-for-profit, whatever it might be, one of the biggest problems is the organizations don't know what they know. Meaning, the information is, the answers are in the company, but they don't know where it is. How do you access it? Well, you're going to access it using tools like, like this. Here's, here's one, this is a little company that I'm involved in. Flat World Knowledge is actually a company that is publishing textbooks for free. Now, I would hope you would ask at this point, can you explain the business model <laughs> then? Well, here's the way it works. Um, first of all, the people who started this company came out of the publishing business. And the publishing business is getting reamed right now for really abusing pricing very, very expensive textbooks that people can't afford and so forth. So uh, their idea was to address this problem. What they do is they work with authors. The, 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 there's no patents in this thing, but the proprietary element is they have contracts with authors who are passionate about this concept. And you can see the uh, textbook online for free. And by the way, it's constantly updated, so it's more valuable to the student. If you want a hard copy, you can have it printed online uh, for a very modest amount, something like $30 for a regular textbook would normally be 100 bucks or more. Now, the real key to the equation, however, is that 
you can also have the textbook customized to your needs. There are certain things that are sort of formularic, so depending on your style of learning, they have uh, more graphs or whatever it is. The authors are evolving this technology now, but they've got a lot of them. They've got 100, 100 authors who are doing this stuff. The two fields they're looking at today are business and engineering, because those have expensive textbooks. So that's, that is really innovative. And of course, it's going to be a challenge to the establishment. But I think, I think somewhere on the line, are they going to be the ones who get there? You know, I, I, I bet on them, but we'll see. Uh, the whole idea of focusing on how you communicate in the soft things, the dialogue aspects, are really critical. And there are lots of organizations like this. this is, in a way, an organization that does mediating, but in fact, what they do is they go into areas where there are uh, almost impossible controversies to overcome. Abortion, for example. And they bring people together so that they understand each other beyond the argument, so that they learn to have a dialogue that allows them to live together to address the problem that we have of polarization in our society today. And so, I'll, I, I have to leave you with this. This is where I'm focusing on this sort of thing, trying to get folks together to uh, take on problems that are really tough to observe and follow. This is Kingbridge. It's up in King City, north on, on 400 there. And it was originally built uh, as, as a, uh, a health and spa center uh, by Murray Koffler, by the way, the guy who started Shoppers Drug Mart. And uh, unfortunately, he did that in the late 80s, early 90s, where the real estate market was tanking, so it wasn't good timing. But CIBC took it over as a leadership training center, and then I took it over in, in 2001. And the mission is focusing just on what we've been talking about today. How do you get organizations to really harness their collective intelligence? How do you get a group to take on tough problems and not have people behave like that collection of board folks up there? Let me leave it there and um, let me open it up to, to you for questions. And, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, anybody raising their hand yet? Ah, good. Uh, how, do, how do you take on a, a problem with a group that is going to fail? Have I misstated that? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, that's, that's what is changing. The hierarchical organization uh, it, it still has to exist. You have to have somebody as the ultimate decision maker. But the ultimate decision maker has the very delicate balance of creating an environment where everybody's contribution is welcomed. Already, that's different from a lot of organizations. And uh, uh, many companies have had variations of this. Uh, the uh, what do you call it, when the, the suggestion box where everybody was invited to, you know, slip in a, an, a, a written suggestion for sl solving a problem or describing a problem. Uh, once you create an environment that is open and people are respected, but they're also accountable, so you can't just be wild, the, the power of the group goes up. The, the ideal leader's job is not to be necessarily the decider in chief. It is in fact to create an environment where they're getting the best information from everybody in the organization. That's hard to do, but you see more and more examples. 
And um, I think you're going to see a lot of innovation. Yeah. I think there are ways to do both. This is a little bit of theory Y, theory Z. The Asian cultures recognize that if you make a decision, you don't include everybody, you end up spending time uh, on the implementation side. So part of the idea is setting the stage by including more so that the implementation will go better. But now we're back to the delicate balance. And sometimes when you have uh, an interesting idea that you can't do, and by the way, there are a lot of organizations that do that. Google does this. They actually give people a certain amount of free time to play around. And you know, the, the, the Google story is not over. <laughs> it's going to be very interesting to see how it evolves as it gets bigger. It has to deal with, with more of those problems. But, uh, it's a legitimate question. It, it's the darn balance problem. Yeah. Um, how do you uh, reward ideas? Because a lot of people have great ideas that potentially are million dollar ideas. But how in this kind of process can you facilitate rewards for people to keep them up and sharing your ideas? Uh, do you know the, the Lotus Notes story? The question is, is how do you incentivize people to contribute ideas? Let me tell you the Lotus Notes story. Lotus Notes was kind of the first big successful information exchange software. And one of the first clients was Anderson Consulting. And uh, they bought, they sell seats, that's the way they do it, something like 25,000 seats it was a big deal. And said, we want everybody to contribute their ideas. This is the way we're going to run it as an organization. Wrong. It didn't work. Nobody was going to contribute their ideas because if you're in the consulting business, hey, your whole value is, is what you uniquely know. So they stepped back and they said, we're going to redo the thing. And what they did is they created an incentive so that the more you contributed to the database, the more your salary went up and your, you got promoted. But it wasn't just contributing ideas, because you could game that in two seconds just by pouring ideas in. What they did is everybody had to rate everybody else, uh, rate their ideas, a little bit uh, like eBay. So eBay did not come up with that idea. <laughs> the Lotus Notes folks did. So that, that's actually a famous business school case, is when you have these changes, you've got to design the system to work. Uh, one of the things that I'm involved with uh, is a, a robotic competition. And uh, we have one uh, here at the Hershey uh, Center and then all, all, all over the world, actually. And here's the way it works. One of the things we want to do is get kids so science and technology is cool and fun. So we got the sports model. And that, that seems to work. But we want it more than that. We want them to learn to collaborate. So how do you incentivize that? You not only collaborate with the other people on your team, you even collaborate, God forbid, with your competitor. Wow, that sounds strange. Excuse me. That's the way capitalism works. Capitalism would not work if people didn't understand and, and accept certain rules. So you've got to collaborate to accept the rules and go beyond that. And here's how we do it. We design the game so that the kids spend six weeks designing a robot to accomplish certain tasks. It's defined new each year. They build this robot. It's got certain limits in size and power and weight and all of that sort of stuff. But other than that, it's a freestyle sort of deal. When they go to the competition, they, they play in a, in, a, in a ring, if you will, that's got these different tasks. They bump into each other, it's all, all, all that. But it's not one-on-one. -on -one. You play in an alliance 
with one other or two other robots against one, two, or three robots on the other side. You don't play once. You play multiple times, like a dozen times. And your partners change. Begin to get the incentives now. You don't want to stab your future partner in the back. And so it leads to some interesting phenomena. Now, we design the game differently every year. One year, we did it another way. Instead of getting so many points and going directly to you, you would get so many points for accomplishing tasks, but your score would be three times the loser's score. Can you figure that out? You don't want to win 100 to nothing. <laughs> your score is nothing. You want to win 51 to 49. And that's tricky to do. So the point is how you design the system, and excuse me, in your business, how you design the rules and motivations for how you behave with your customers as well, with your competitors, is very, very important. And you can create incentives so it is worthwhile to do, hopefully. Yeah. So does a company like Boston Scientific, do they see value in making the technology open source? <laughs> well, boy, that's, that's a delicate balance. And, and uh, uh, Steve Jobs has done pretty well <laughs> with his not quite so open source. Uh, in certain areas, yes. And in other areas, no. And are you familiar with the Creative Commons license? That, that's that's the, the relationship for open source. But it's not a license. It's actually a whole range of versions that are increasingly open. So it might be that you have one component that you make open, but you make certain things that go on top of that proprietary. Or you might not make it open, but create a free license version for it, so, but they have to register. And that may have value for you when you want to make changes going downstream. When you think of, of uh, Linux, Linux actually wasn't quite open source. Long, long problem, uh, long ago problem. But uh, it was semi-open source. And that is what I would argue you need to do in any organization. But part of the thing that will make it uh, successful is creating a system so people buy into it. So give them the responsibility of solving the problem. If they're criticizing you and say you can't do it that way, the response is, okay, here's what we're trying to do. How would you go about doing it? And that changes the mindset a little bit so that it's our problem, not your problem, in theory. <laughs> Being consistent, of course, in all of this is, is not a trivial, trivial matter. Yeah? Yeah. Because otherwise, the authors would not do anything. So it's, they would thought it was necessary to give the law to allow the monopoly 30 years after the death of the authors. So yeah. that's what this is done to keep the collective royalties. Uh, do you think it's. So the, the question is, is how do you deal with open source and copyright law, if it's that, that, that book publishing thing? Uh, and there's probably a lot of other parallels uh, that are same. And, and my answer to that is you need to modify the law. The, the world has changed. iTunes was Steve Jobs' great contribution to solving the Napster problem. And that was an innovation that 
allowed people to look at things totally upside down. Those are the innovations that are just as important as coming up with a new chemical or coming up with a new product or whatever it is, the social innovations. And we're going to see a lot of that simply because those tools <laughs> that are out there allowing people to be publishing. I mean, the YouTube phenomenon creates a million legal problems and people are trying to figure out what to do there. Uh, Wikipedia. Jim, Jimmy Wales, the sort of the god of the Wikipedia, is, is actually just that. There are, there are certain rules that it's open for everybody, but he found what happened is people were abusing it for their own, own purposes. Like, for example, when it was, you know, descriptions of politicians. Well, obviously, the enemy of the politician would keep adding to those descriptions. And so what he did is he developed a lock and said, we're going to lock certain areas out. So you're adapting the social system to fit the technological and cultural changes that are coming along at the same time. Phenomenal opportunities to, to uh, create new businesses. But the, the, the proprietary model may be very different. Think about uh, uh, Linus Torvald. Of, of Linux fame. Uh, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, he gave it away. But what happened is he earned a worldwide reputation. And uh, a lot of people came to him with all sorts of, of opportunities, which he took, and he's doing very well. Thank you. But it was, it's, it's really a different way of planning out your life, of design it so that you are constantly open to opportunity. And then you can make the decision. So you, you keep the most options open by doing it that way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The Linux model is pretty complicated. You have Red Hat, Red Hat and you have a whole bunch of others who are basically application things and they've got proprietary information that goes on top. But the key is, this is where uh, 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 Linus needed, he's the guy who knows the most. He sees the entire picture, so he automatically had a great deal to contribute. So he had a consulting business and that consulting business also led to interest in various other operations. Uh, yeah, you know, now you come back to the IBM uh, model, and IBM chose op open source, and it, it actually didn't work ideally for IBM. That's why they sold it to Lenovo. But I think if Phil Eskridge, the guy who died, who started the whole uh, IBM thing first, I think they would still be in the business. You have to have the right, the right leader who is really doing more than leading. They are creating the image and the understanding and the philosophy of what the business is meant, meant to be. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. Um, there's levels of collaboration again, and certainly we had a lot of arch rivals, but in the history of the company, what happened was, my view is the opportunity for us was not market share. The opportunity for us was market. And we had a major challenge to overcome which is getting the establishment to accept that maybe smaller holds are better after all. And so, yeah, we were competing in some areas with, with a lot of other companies, uh, but because we had reasonably good relationships with them, we could be both uh, collaborators and competitors at the same time. And then what happened uh, as we grew, we came across a time period 
when the marketplace changed dramatically because of uh, the Clinton uh, new solve the healthcare problem uh, strategy, and our hospitals started acquiring each other and becoming health systems. And we realized that unless we grew faster and strategically, we would become marginalized in the marketplace. And so we said, now's the time to acquire. So those companies that were competitors, but we had collaborated with, we were able to talk with, and they said, you know, I like their philosophy. I'd like to work with them. So in a different way, we were collaborating, but we're back to the delicate balance uh, problem. When I used to travel around, and I still do it, uh, I would be in sometimes somewhat awkward position because I would know what a lot of different research groups, mostly physicians, were doing. And I obviously couldn't tell them, but I could say, maybe you ought to talk to X. That's another that's a way to say, I think you're doing similar things. And, and maybe two and two is five here. You'd have to determine that. And uh, the role of pollinator for growth of a field is very important. And it's recognized and appreciated. So it's like everything else in life, it's the balance thing. And you, you want to create an understanding that there are levels of, of things that have to be proprietary, uh, but there are things there that you would benefit by telling them about. And that's what I would always like to do. One more. Yeah, great question. Um, life isn't all about money. And, and, and uh, uh, the, 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 the gathering of knowledge and the creating of relationships can produce extraordinary opportunities for you. And look what it's done for Jimmy Wales. Sure, that's been a free thing. And I think Wikipedia now actually has employees. I think they've got 30 employees. And what they're doing for that is just amazing to me. But you're right, it's mostly volunteer. And it's people who are doing things on the side. But in fact, they gain knowledge, they gain expertise. And then they can apply that. You know, don't start out with a business plan. Start out with understanding the opportunities. And, and then you can figure out the business plan. But it's, it's, it's almost a separate thing uh, in, in the process. That's, that's my view. Truly Thank you, Tony. Talk. It's, it's interesting that we are actually meeting in what Mars calls our collaboration center. That's right. And I think it's no accident that Mars is delighted to be collaborating with John in, in the Kingbridge uh, facility, finding ways that, that, that we can work together. So again, my thanks for, uh, for a great talk. My pleasure. Thank you. And thank you.